everyone. Welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm Jessie from the Gardener's Workshop. Today's episode features a takeover of our popular weekly live Q&A session on Instagram called Ask a Flower Farmer, and this one was hosted by Dave Dowling of Ball Color Link. Dave is also a former flower farmer and the instructor of our online course called Flower Farming School Online, Bulbs, Perennials, Woodies, and more. Dave is always so happy to share his knowledge with our listeners. And here, he answers questions about many different flowers, including peonies, campanula, flowering kale, stock, calla lilies, eucalyptus, and many more. So listen in, and I hope you enjoy. First, a word about the Field and Garden Podcast. The Field and Garden Podcast is a part of the Gardener's Workshop. The Gardener's Workshop has been telling the stories and how-tos of growing, selling, and helping others to pursue their flower-growing dreams for over 25 years. What began as one gardening enthusiast sharing her passion has grown into so much more. Over at thegardenersworkshop.com, find in print with our blogs and books and through our podcasts and videos and courses. And we have a shop full of the same tools, seeds, and supplies that you hear mentioned on our podcast. You can connect with all of these resources over at thegardenersworkshop.com. I hope you'll take some time to explore all we have for you. Welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. Hi folks, so I'm here for the Gardener's Workshop Ask the Flower Farmer Takeover. Um, again, my name is Dave Dowling. Um, I've had a cut flower farm in Maryland for 20 years. I now work for Ball Seed or the Ball Color Link office as a sales, sales support or sales rep to cut flower growers all across the U.S. and also do my online class with the Gardener's Workshop, which we now have registrations open for the class right now if you're interested in that. All the information is at thegardenersworkshop.com, where if you buy the class today and register for it, you get instant access instant access to the class now. So if you sign up, you can binge watch it all right away or, or look up those different topics that you're interested in. My class is all about uh, cut flower bulbs, perennials, woodies, and more. Um, so if you're going to take a look at that at thegardenersworkshop.com, it has all the information. And as you know, Lisa also has her class that's the basically the, the basics of uh, a cut flower business, setting up the business and the annual crops. And if you maybe taken one of our classes and you want to take the other one now, um, anybody who's taken one of our classes in the past or any of the classes from the Gardener's Workshop, uh, you get a discount. Okay, I see a couple of questions here. Let's see what people are asking. What are the best varieties of nine bark, smoke bush, and baptisia for zone eight? Well, for the Baptisia, there's the, the old standby called Australis, which is this typical bluish purple color. Um, it's the cheapest one to buy, but Proven Winners has a whole series out now. Um, there's yellow, you know, bright, bright yellow, uh, burgundy, purple, almost a black one. There's a white one. They're all good. Any of them will work. Um, the only thing is if you buy the uh, Proven Winner type, they're more expensive, but it's definitely worth it. Because a Baptisia plant, after two or three years, is going to give you 30, 40, maybe 50 stems per plant. So, you know, even if you spent $3 on a plant, you're going to make $50 a year off of that plant, year two and three, and from then on. <clears throat> so you can't go wrong with any of the Baptisia. Just make sure it's a taller variety. I don't think there's any uh, short varieties out there yet. Unfortunately, a lot of the perennial breeding, the new varieties are bred to be short and stocky. So they fit in a pot on the on the bench at Home Depot or the garden center. Um, so you always gotta be careful. I know there's some flocks that are beautiful, but they're only eight or 10 inches tall. So always check the height. But like I said, I don't think there's any short baptisias on the market yet. It's a pretty tall plant and I don't think they're gonna be able to, to breed down to get a shorter variety of that. Um, for the nine bark, um, I'm drawing blank on the names, but again, there's some that are from proven winners that are the, um, one is called summer wine, I believe. It's a dark purple color. They have a copper color one. Uh, it used to be called Coppertina. Those are fine. And for smoke bush, there's not many to choose from. You just get the, the generic old fashioned one that's been around forever and you can't go wrong with it. But on both of the nine bark and smoke bush, make sure you cut them down every spring before they start to grow. And then you get nice tall stems to harvest. 
it's definitely not a plant that you don't want to let just grow every year and not do a lot of hard harvesting and cutting all the stems. Otherwise, you end up with this big bush with lots of branchy short stems that aren't much good. Uh, the next question is, early bird blooms wants to know the best way, how long can you store peonies when they're wrapped in the bud? Now, they're, they're talking about taking peonies where you harvest them at the marshmallow stage, make sure the foliage is totally dry, no moisture on it, and you uh, wrap them in paper and store them in the cooler. You can easily store them that way for three or four weeks. Um, I know sometimes people have stored them for three or four months. I know at a conference one time in November, a grower in Vermont brought peonies. They looked okay, but they're not gonna last that long. Um, I always recommend only storing them for three or four weeks at the most. If you had to have them for a later event, you could do them longer, just know that they, the quality goes down and the vase life also diminishes. So three or four weeks is about the limit in my book. Ah, Buffalo Springs has a great question about flowering kale. Um, they're considering trying kale for this fall and the winter and wonder if they have any advice. Well, you're asking at the right time because this is when you should be starting the seed, sowing your seed for uh, flowering kale. You start them in mid-June. Um, it's still time to order the seed, throw in a plug real quick for Ball Seed, a company I work for. If you order a seed from them by 5 p.m. Central Time, it will ship out that day. And depending where you're at in the country or in even Canada they ship to, you'll have that seed the next day or two or three days later. Um, so if you place your orders by 5 p.m., they ship out the same day or the next day if it's um, after 5 p.m. Um, but now is when you want to start the kale. The biggest thing with kale is you want to plant them uh, kind of dense. Um, they definitely do need to have support netting or support wire because they're going to fall over and get floppy, crooked stems. Um, but you want to plant three plants per square of the netting, which is a six inch square, and you get four six inch squares in a square foot. So there's actually 12 plants per square foot. So you plant them pretty dense and that makes them grow tall and keeps the flower size more manageable. If you were to grow one as a single stem all by itself, that flower or those leaves, it's not really a flower, but those leaves are going to be 12, 15 inches across and it's just too big. So by growing them close together, you manipulate the plant to have smaller flowers and, and taller stems. And also when they're close together like that, all the lower leaves naturally fall off because it gets dark down in there and it's much fewer leaves to strip when it's time to harvest. But then one of the most important things about growing flowering kale is watch for the cabbage worms because cabbage worms will fly in the cute little lime green or whitish moths or butterflies. You think they're pretty, they're laying thousands of eggs and within two weeks you're kale has been destroyed sometimes. I've seen growers who lost the entire crop because they weren't paying attention. Um, so you want to make sure you treat for that. And the best thing to use for that is BT, which is a um, organic bacillus. I can't say the actual name, but BT is the uh, spray you want to use for the cabbage worms. As soon as you see those uh, little moths flying around, spray the BT and that way you'll save your crop. But the flowering kale for the fall, like I said, now is the time to be starting the seed, sometime between early to mid or even the third week of June, and you have an amazing crop. And the other thing is if you grow those in the field and also put some in a tunnel, the tunnel won't color up quite as quick because it doesn't have the cold nights in September that they need. They won't color up for maybe three or four weeks later than the ones in the field. But if you have kale growing in a tunnel, it's gonna still be fine in Thanksgiving in almost any zone, even like zone three or four, because the protection of the tunnel, because they can freeze a little bit. Um, if you're in zone 7 or 6B, those uh, kale are still going to be good at Christmas, and I've even seen them good at Valentine's Day in an unheated tunnel in zone 7. Next question, Young's Flower Farm. Can you please help me figure out how to charge a restaurant for flowers? Oh, that's a tricky one. I'm thinking bud vases for tables and a bouquet for the entryway. I currently only sell to florists, so looking for a way to sell retail. Well, first, the biggest Hint, you said there was retail, so it's going to be a much higher price or at least a higher price than what you're selling now to the florist. Because um, if that restaurant went to the florist that you're selling to, they'd be paying the retail price. So like if you're selling a sunflower to the florist for a dollar or a dollar twenty-five, that restaurant's paying two dollars to that florist if they're buying sunflowers. So sometimes farmers don't realize how uh, expensive flowers are at the retail level. Um, if you think of just a typical vase, you know, like a happy birthday that came from 1-800 flowers from your local flower shop. Um, those cost 60 or $70 and as much as $100. So you do not want to be selling a mixed bouquet for the entryway to this restaurant for $20 a week. That just doesn't work. Um, it should be 40 or $50. Um, you'll most likely rotate vases out. So you have a, a two or three vases you use and just rotate it back and forth. So you're not selling a vase every time. You're just loaning them a vase, but it's not 
the cost of the vase doesn't have to be included every week. Um, bud vases, you know, they're gonna uh, pay for those vases or maybe they already have them, but the flowers figures two or $3 a flower. And if you're gonna put them in the vases, you gotta consider your labor. Um, I one time did a restaurant and I basically took them a bucket of, I forget, it was 75 or 100 stems and the restaurant owner's wife is the one that put them in the bud vases. And she did a great job of it, but that saved them the money. I was selling them just the flowers. So you gotta figure what your, what services you're providing. If it's a finished vase sitting on the tables, that's different than if you give them flowers and they put them in the vases. Um, one of the quick things I want to throw out is I know a florist in Baltimore, um, Ellen Frost with Local Color Flowers, that you probably know who she is. She only uses flowers from local farms. And she does a couple of restaurants, or I know at least one, where they don't pay her in cash, they pay her in gift cards. So it saves the restaurant a little bit of money because they're giving a gift card that has a higher value than their cost of the food they're going to give. But then she can go to dinner there. She gives the gift cards out to her employees. Um, you know, I've gone to dinner there a couple of times with her. So that's another option as a payment option for doing flowers for a restaurant is do a little bartering um, instead of just like, having them write your check. Uh, small Batch in Hawaii has a question, growing tips for eucalyptus, watering, fertilizer, etc. cetera. Um, eucalyptus is my number one foliage. If you can grow it, if you have to do it in a tunnel, if you're farther north or some in Hawaii, you can grow it all the time. Um, year round, it's, I don't think this freezes in Hawaii at all. <laughs> um, it's a foliage that everyone should grow. The biggest thing is for watering, when you first plant them out, um, I recommend buying plugs because they're just as slow as uh, lisianthus. It can take you 12 weeks to grow a plant that's that tall, you know, an inch tall and ready to transplant. So buying plugs is a much easier way to go. But it's really important to keep them watered when you first transplant them or you'll end up having some die because the roots are in that small plug and they've got to wait till it roots into your soil. Uh, so it can be, um, you know, maintain itself and get water out of the ground. So you need to keep, Keep the water just like any transplant. You might have to water them, hand water them every day, twice a day if it's hot and dry. Um, one other thing on the eucalyptus, I recommend if you're um, obviously not in Hawaii, but in other areas of your zone, five, six, and seven, grow it in a high tunnel and it will pay for that high tunnel in the long run and those plants come back every year bigger and better. As far as fertilizing, any fertilizer will work. Um, a balanced fertilizer like 10, 10, 10. Um, but you should always do a soil test just in case some places the soil is really high in phosphorus. You wouldn't want to be adding more if you already have enough there. So you should always do a soil test and then see what nutrients you're missing. But usually a, a balanced fertilizer will work everywhere unless you're already excess in one nutrient. Uh, the next question is from Chris Rye. Ranunculus is done here in Iowa. She has a second 75 row now in the hoop house that will become available. Is it up to me? What would I plant? Okay, so they've got a 75 foot row in the hoop house that the ranunculus has done. They're coming out. What would I put in the hoop house? It's late, too late to put in lisianthus. Lisianthus doesn't rotate well with uh, ranunculus because the ranunculus doesn't end soon enough. Uh, to me, the best thing to put in a high tunnel after ranunculus comes out is celosia. And I'm talking the, the good, expensive celosias, like the, the crested. Um, you could do chief, which is a, a cheap, affordable seed. Or if you want to do the fancier crested ones, like there's Act and I can't remember the other one, um, Bombay. Those are ones, the seed's more expensive, but the flower's totally different. Um, it's some more unique colors, but those would work fine to go in a high tunnel in the summer. Um, they love the heat. As long as you keep them watered when they're young, they're going to grow like crazy and do really well in a high tunnel. They love the heat. So that would be my choice to go in after Ranunculus comes out. And then those are also finished then in time to rotate back in anemones or something else in the fall. And like you know, you should always rotate your crops. So if you have ranunculus there this winter, they should move over to a different bed and put anemones where the ranunculus were last winter. So you rotate. Um, Fian Viet wants to know, can I share tips on how and when to harvest butterfly ranunculus? Um, butterfly ranunculus is a little bit different because they you let them start to open because it's not a single flower on one flower on one stem. It's a whole spray of flowers. So you wait till that main first flower is actually open and the second ones, the secondary blood, buds on that stem are actually starting to open and colored up really well. And you cut it like regular ranunculus to cut off the first bloom. You can leave that first bloom because they are so long lasting. Um, you're not going to like, sometimes the lisianthus, if you cut a lisianthus and leave all the flowers, that very first one that opens is going to go bad before any of the other ones are or even open sometimes. But for the butterfly vernacular, you do not need to disbud that first bloom in the center. Um, Edith's Farm, in zone four and had flower boxes built, 
want to plant tulips in them in this fall with a, with, yeah, with a freeze because they're on the ground. Um, I'm not sure how big your flower boxes are, but my thing is if it's too big to pick up and move, then you could probably do it. If it's a flower box that's, you know, four inches wide and three feet long, that would not work for tulips because uh, the tulips should not freeze really hard every night, which it would do if the box is up on the ground. But then also, not only do they freeze really hard at night, but every day when it's a sunny day or you get a day with the temperatures in the 40s, it thaws out and, and warms them up. So that constant freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing is not good for the tulips. So if the box is big enough, you know, if it's a huge box that's three feet wide, you know, it's a, a, like a big raised bed, then you'd be fine doing that. Just don't plant them right against the very edge of the board. Come in about two or three inches, and then you should be fine. Uh, Laura Keller wants to know if eucalyptus will overwinter in zone eight. It most definitely should without any problem, but if you want to ensure it, that it does, um, take and mulch it with either shredded leaves or straw. Um, first, you'd have to at some point cut it down to about 18 inches, shred it with, shred, mulch it with shredded leaves or uh, straw, put clear plastic or um, row cover over it, um, and that'll help keep it from freezing. And even if the trunk and the limbs die, it'll grow back right at the ground level and still be amazing plants. But zone eight, it should always overwinter. Young's Mill Flower Farm. You're in the second year of farming. Uh, welcome to the club. Uh, turning over beds and looking for perennials. I've got 40 or 50 peonies that were new this year, selling mostly to florist and retail. I'm assuming retail is either the farm stand or something like that. Um, would you recommend any peony, in, any perennial in particular? Um, two minutes from Lisa, so uh, zone 8A. Other perennials, you've got 40 or 50 peonies. I would definitely get more peonies. Um, I like to say you need at least 100 peonies if you're going to be a, doing this full time with expecting a lot of income and a lot of sales. You want to have many hundreds of peonies, three or 400, 500 is not too many. Um, if you've got a big customer base, and that means either a couple of really good big farmers markets or a dozen florists that use a lot of flowers, you can um, you could use that many peony plants. But other uh, perennials, uh, one of my favorites is phlox. Um, there's a variety called David. It's a really tall white one that's mildew resistant. It's great, um, but there's other varieties. But again, like I mentioned earlier, there's some phlox newer ones the beautiful flowers that are 10 or 12 inches tall just make sure you check the height um, one of the new series that's out by um, darwin perennials is actually called garden girls and those are tall enough they grow about 30 inches tall um, plenty tall enough for harvesting as a cut flower um, and those are available as either liners or plug uh, liners or bare root through walters perennials has those and you can order anything from walters perennials through ball seed um, other perennials there's one that somebody just posted the other day online. It's the clustered bellflower, uh, Campanula glomerata. Um, it's a blue, blue flower, uh, little clusters of uh, little florets at the top of the stem. stem. Someone commented, be careful, it spreads and gets invasive. And I commented back, invasive cut flowers just mean you can make more money because you have more stems to sell. You can always you know, mow around the edge if it gets too big. But it's a great early bloomer. It's blooming now in most places. It usually is right about when peonies are finishing up and it's just this amazing blue, blue flower that's usually still some good for 4th of July in the US and you would do that red, white, and blue look. Um, other perennials, uh, yarrow is one of my favorite. Um, there's the old one that's been around forever, Coronation Gold, that is a, the really stiff stem, golden color, but I like Moonshine better. It's a little bit softer yellow, but again, that really stiff stem that actually can be dried. Um, so that one for the yarrow or um, Achillea. And then uh, Sedum. You cannot go wrong with Sedum Autumn Joy. It can be sold as a green bud before they bloom, uh, in flower, and even after the flowers start to go bad, it doesn't look ugly. Um, it's still usable over a really long period of time. You can harvest those usually from, oh, I saw some recently around me here in Southern Delaware were big enough to harvest right now. Um, so usually by late June, all of July, and into early August, then late August is when the flowers start to die. So Sedum Autumn Joy, and there's some new ones out. I can't remember the name. There's one that has black foliage. If you want something really different, um, it's a variety. It's called Midnight or Dark Night or something like that. Um, Walter's Perennials has that. It's a newer variety. It is patented, so you gotta pay the royalty fee, but it's worth it. Um, so those are the perennials I would recommend adding, but definitely up your game on the uh, peonies first. And one other really good one is Baptisia. I mentioned that earlier in the discussion today. Uh, Blair House blooms and no spacing for field grown dis the discus. Um, usually uh, six or eight inches is fine. You can do as much as 10 or 12. Uh, those flowers are kind of light and airy, so you don't have to uh, space them out too far. 
Uh, Jess Babin, zone four, had really good luck starting seeds for verbascum and obedient plant, good or bad for cuts. Um, well, two comments. Verbascum tends to shed really easy. Um, you probably have the one called Southern Charm, um, which there's that seed company that produces that, does promote it as a cut flower, but you want to cut it when it's just starting to bloom or you have petals all over the table. <clears throat> um, it's very uh, ethylene sensitive. Like most spike flowers, delphinium, uh, larkspur, um, they drop their petals really easy if they're exposed to too much uh, of the ethylene gas. So that means you don't want to pick them until you're ready to sell them. They're not a good one to store in the cooler for several days. Um, I know a farmer one time had a car full of salvia leucantha. Um, he loaded up the van the night before the market and the ethylene gas developed in the van overnight. And when he took them out the next one, they, they just rained petals on the ground just from being closed up in a closed van overnight. Um, so for Bascom, if you want to use that, just pick it as it's just starting to bloom, just starting to open. Obedient plant is great. Um, they call it obedient plant. I could never get it to be obedient. You know, you're supposed to be able to bend the stem and it stays there. Never worked for me. But I had to stop growing it because right when it was blooming, there was a little teeny beetle where I had my farm that always get inside of every little floret. So if you think you got that stem with 50 little white flowers on it or the pink ones, and there's a little black beetle inside of every one, and there was nothing I could do to stop that. Um, I didn't want to spray, you know, chemicals to, to get rid of the beetles, so I just stopped growing it. Um, obedient plant is one that's supposed to be a little invasive and it spreads, but as long as you don't have that beetle problem and it spreads, you have more stems to pick. Um, it does work as a cut flower. Again, you want to pick it when they're just starting to open. Um, the Painted Petal Flower Co. wants to know, where's the best source for peony plants? Well, I've got to say ball seed. Um, we have several of our vendors or our suppliers offer them. Edney Flower Bulbs out of New Jersey and Oregon, they have the largest selection of peonies. Um, last I checked, it's almost 100 varieties. Um, but then we also have a new thing with ball called High Volume Bare Root, where we sell bare root peonies from Holland. You have to buy a full crate, but a full crate is only 60 plants in a size three to five or 100 plants in the size two to three eye. Um, the difference is the two to three eye only has two to three sprouts. Three to five has three to five sprouts. Um, but the difference in production, if you plant a three to five eye plant, you're gonna start harvesting off those plants a year earlier than the two to three eye. So I always recommend getting the three to five eye, even if it costs you two or three dollars more, you can get your investment back faster. Um, so that's my source for peony roots is from order through ball or uh, ball seed or ball color link and um, from the different vendors or different suppliers that we work with. Um, peony usually ship the second or third week of October. My recommendation is always have your beds ready to plant. Uh, you already prepped your beds, checked your fertilizer. If you're gonna grow them in the black landscape fabric, you have that already and in place and ready to go. So when those plants arrive, you're ready to plant them right away because nothing's worse than have the peonies show up the third week of October and you're in an area that all of a sudden, two weeks later, you get this early snowstorm and you haven't planted your peonies yet because you don't have the bed ready. And then you're stuck out there working in the snow or doing something like trying to save them to plant in the spring. And that's never a good idea. You want to get them planted as soon as they arrive. Um, back to the question here, somebody's asking about the peonies and bud. They also wonder how long you can store them in water. I always like to store them no longer than a week in water. So in the cooler, if you pick, I used to like to pick every day of the week. As you know, if you have peonies, you pick them every day of the week, two or three times a day sometimes. Um, but you store them in water, keep the water shallow so the stems aren't soaking in water, so maybe only a couple inches of water. And I would store them about a week in the cooler. Uh, but you can see that their buds are still firm and tight. They haven't blown open. They're still good to sell. But about a week in water, if you want to do longer than that, you want to uh, store them dry. Um, experience with bronze fennel as a bouquet filler. It's beautiful. Yeah, it works fine. Um, it's that big umbral, umbrella-shaped kind of a, I don't know what color. It's not really green. It's got a weird color to it. Um, but it also smells good. It smells like licorice. So that's great. It does work as a cut filler. Um, but make sure you harvest it all because it can go to seed and come back and be a little too thick, uh, kind of weedy in the next year. Uh, Harmony in blooms. Her stock only blooms along the tips and not along the stem. Is it my bad? Planting timer has something to do with spacing or soil. I grow both cats and iron. Appreciate your help. Um, it could be the time you're planting them. If they're if the nighttime temperatures are getting too warm when they're trying to open, they're gonna say, I'm blooming the tip of this flower stem and I'm done, it's too hot. Stock likes to have nighttime temperatures in the 50s when they're actually opening and the flowers are blooming. If your nights are in the 60s or you have them in a tunnel and you're not venting it enough and you're cooking them during the day, 
even if it's getting to 56 or 58 at night, but you're too hot during the day, that plant's not gonna open all the way down. Plus, really important to make sure you keep them well watered. Any plant that's putting up flower stems or trying to open flowers, if they're uh, starving for water, the flower quality is gonna go down. Um, the other thing with stock, make sure you're planting them close together, just like the uh, flowering kale. You wanna aim for 12 plants per square foot and make sure you use uh, support netting. Uh, this is a good question from Buffalo Springs. Do you pinch the kale and how long is the harvest window? Um, when I was out in California back in March at the, what they call CAST, um, so all the plant breeding companies put out all the new stuff and it's an amazing week. It's 95% cut uh, bedding plants, but there's always some cut flower stuff in there. Um, the one company that specializes in the kale, they also do little short bedding plant ones and they had a whole series where they were showing how to pinch them, but they haven't figured out how to make that work yet as a cut flower to where it would be tall enough and then pinched where you'd have uh, you know three or four little flowers. I know I sometimes had where a plant would get damaged and it would branch, but it never quite was the quality I wanted to, to pinch it on purpose. Um, so it's something you could experiment with. If you have some kale, just pinch a half dozen plants and see what they do to you, do for you. You wouldn't pinch them until they're tall because you're not trying to pinch it to get you know six tall stems. I think you're trying to get a spray of flowers up together at the top of one stem that would harvest as a, a group of flowers. So I, if you want to try that, you know, wait till it's six inches tall, eight inches tall, and then pinch the top out. But I wouldn't do it to the whole crop. Try it on your own little experiment and do it on half a dozen or a dozen plants and see what happens. But here's a really good question. How long is the harvest window? The harvest window on flowering kale can be from second week of September when they first start showing color. Depends on where you're at. Uh, your nighttime temperature is cool in the 50s is what causes it to color up. Um, so early September until after light frost in a tunnel till, like I said earlier, Thanksgiving, Christmas. So the harvest one is really long. It's not like a sunflower where all oh, the sunflowers are ready today. That one petal's getting loose, starting to come up from the center disc. I've got to pick sunflowers. You can walk away from this kale and not even think about picking them for the next week or wait two more weeks and pick them again. Just keep an eye out for the worms, uh, the cabbage worms. But yeah, there's a very long harvest window. Um, it's one of those things that if you don't want to harvest them today, leave them. They're still good next week. Looks like Hereford Sheila, Sheila, she's in the UK. Uh, welcome there from the, across the pond. Um, it's a way I can succession plant alliums. Not really because they're a bulb that's gonna come up when the springtime temperatures are right, but there are some uh, alliums that are sold as perennials that are um, herbaceous perennials. They don't have the bulb like you would do with a regular allium like the purple sensation, um, but they have a flower that doesn't bloom until late June, early July here in the US. I think you're about the same seasons in the UK. Um, I know Walter's Garden sells them here in the US. I'm sure there's somebody in, in the EU or in uh, England that would sell them in the UK. It's a summer blooming annual. It would be in with the perennials. They're not quite as tall. They're only 18 to 20 inches tall, but sometimes that's all you need. Uh, but they're very productive. One plant will put up 10 or 15 flowers, as opposed to a, a true allium where you're planting one bulb and get one flower. So if you wanna have alliums later in the season, look into the, the perennial alliums that would be sold as a potted plant or a bare root plant um, that you'd be planting in the spring, but for summer flowers, and that should be perennial, I think it's zone five or six. Uh, Poplar Creek Flower Farm, are there any good preventative measures to keep aphids off of the sweet peas? Well, right before I came in for this Instagram Live, I was out in my vegetable garden and my sweet and regular food peas were covered with aphids. And I took the hose and put my thumb over the end of it and just power wash the aphids off. Um, that's what I did because I'm growing food. I don't want to spray them with anything, but preventative for aphids. Um, if you're in a high tunnel is to get the good bugs, uh, predator bugs. There's companies that specialize in it. Um, I can't think the name right now, but if you just go to Google and, and Google uh, beneficial insects, there's two or three big companies in the US, I'm sure in the rest of the world too, that sell them. Um, I was talking to a customer somebody recently somewhere, uh, I think it was in Facebook, where she starts getting the good bugs back in March and she never has problems with aphids and thrips and stuff in her tunnels because she starts getting them on a regular basis every two or three weeks. She says it's not cheap, but it's cheaper than losing your flowers to aphids um, and you're not buying any sprays to spray on them. So I would look into the uh, beneficial insects, but if you have them on your sweet peas right now, just go up the hose Put your thumb over the end of it like you're, like you're spraying the neighborhood kids, <laughs> if you know what I mean, and just wash those aphids off. They'll go on the ground and they'll die. Um, they'll, you'll drown them. But that's the best way to get rid of if you have a, a big infestation of aphids now. 
Uh, deer resistant perennials for cutting. Interesting that you ask, in my class, there's a list of the perennials that deer don't like. Um, they don't eat Baptisia, they don't eat peonies, they don't eat yarrow. Um, those are three of the main ones I think that they don't eat. I know they love phlox, they like uh, sedum. Uh, they don't eat the uh, Campanula clustered bellflower. Um, but there is a list in my class of the deer resistant uh, perennial cut flowers. Uh, Creekside growers, she had a heat wave last week and her callas are suffering. How much shade can they handle? They can take almost total shade. Um, I think Creekside, if I remember you're down south somewhere, the Carolinas or Kansas, somewhere like that's hot already. Um, you could grow them on the shady side of the barn or the shady side of a building where they really get no sun at all or just a few hours early or late in the day and they would be fine. And that would actually give you taller stems by growing them there. Um, but if you're trying to put shade cloth over them, 50% shade would be a big help. Um, if you don't have a real shade cloth, several layers of remay or row cover would also help shade them. But just as important is if they're already up and growing and you've got leaves and flowers showing, make sure you're watering them enough. Um, hot, dry weather, the, the cow is just gonna, the leaves are gonna curl up because it's too dry. The flowers will be short and scrawny. They're not gonna do well. Make sure you're watering them enough once they're pushing up leaves and flowers. The soil should never dry out. Short stop flowers, zone three, so a little bit cold up in Saskatchewan. Um, is ladies' mantle a good sub for Bupleurum? Ladies' mantle would not, it's, it's a great thing to grow. It's the same color, um, but it's short. It grows maybe when you've got the flower eight inches tall. Um, the foliage is also great, but it's not a sub for Bupleurum. You'd want to grow both. Um, and up in zone three, I don't think you do Bupleurum fall planting it like a cool season annual or the cool flower. Pretty sure you would do a, a very late winter planting of those. Or if you have a tunnel, you might be able to get it over winter in a tunnel. But it's ladies' mantle and bupleurum, two, two similar looking flowers with very different growth habit and height. So it wouldn't be a sub, it would just be grow them both. Creekside growers, um, two questions. First, you're harvesting Campanula Champion. Are they a one and done or will they send up new foliage and flowers? They're a one and done. Um, the Champion, the Campanula Champion, there's Champion 1, Champion 2, and Champion Pro. They're all a little bit different in the size of the flower and the, the number of flowers, but they're all the same. They were bred for cut flower production. Uh, they're a one and done. Sometimes you may get a little side shoot if it's if you got a really big plant, uh, but it's a one, cut it and you're done. Uh, captured moon. I planted a peony plant last year. It came back great, but didn't put out a single bloom. Why? Could either be planted too deep, not enough sun, and also how big was the plant when you started? If it didn't have a flower in it last year, I don't know if you bought bare root or if you bought a potted peony, if it was a potted peony, um, you might have already had a flower on it. It should have flowered this year, but they need to have full sun. Um, make sure the, the crown or the little eyes are down in the, on the top of the root are no more than two inches deep. And also it's really important to make sure that they're watered in July and August, because that's when they're making the new growth and, and beefing up the root and making the eyes or the sprouts for next year. Um, so make sure it's full sun. And again, if you start with a small plant, like, you know, you can buy peonies at the hardware store in the little cardboard box in a plastic bag, they may take two or three years before they bloom. Um, so I got one last question and then I'm running out of time. Um, Resinia Farm, what can I grow between May and June for my CSAs? Um, you didn't say where you're at, but I'm guessing you're probably zone six to eight. Um, the clustered bellflower, Campanula glomerata, is great. Um, it's a great filler um, for early, early to mid-May. Uh, the true biennial sweet william, the one that you have to start the seed in uh, August, plant it out by late September, it overwinters, um, and it's blooming in May, usually Mother's Day and a little bit after and into early June. Great filler, great colors. Um, you can buy the seed and start your own, or we sell plugs through Grow and Sell in Pennsylvania. Um, those are great. Uh, Baptisia, the perennial, it's blooming right as the peonies are finishing up. Um, usually you always see peonies and Baptisia in the same arrangements. Those are great, and obviously peonies um, for May, depending where you're at, some places in warmer areas in May, they're finishing up. Some places when I was in New Jersey, they were just starting in the first week of June. Um, as far as shrubs, there's, or woodies, there's the snowball bush, blooms in June. Um, and any of the cool flowers should still be blooming for you in May. If you don't have Lisa's book, Cool Flowers, go to thegardenersworkshop.com, pick up that book, it's a great book to have. Um, lots of cut flowers in there that you plant in the fall or very early spring, and they're blooming for you in May and June. Um, like Lisa always says, that's the cash crop for the spring. 
you got to plan ahead and plan it in the fall or very early winter or very early spring. Um, just to remind everybody that the registration for my class is open now. Um, if you go to thegardenersworkshop.com, just click on the online classes. You can find mine. If you're already a student from any of the classes from the Garden Workshop, you can get a discount. You would have got an email with a discount code for that. Um, if you have any questions, but Lisa will be back here, or somebody will be back every Wednesday at 1230 Eastern on the Gardener's Workshop page at Instagram for Ask the Flower Farmer. Thank you much, and you'll have a great day. Okay, welcome back. I hope you soaked up some great bits of info there. So I've included some links in the show notes to topics that Dave mentioned here, including the page on our website where you can check out Dave's online course called Flower Farming School Online, Bulbs, Perennials, Woodies, and more. If you're interested in attending an Ask a Flower Farmer Q&A live, you can find them weekly on our Instagram account each Wednesday at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time. These sessions are normally hosted by Lisa Mason Ziegler, but we do have guest takeovers such as this one periodically as well, and I encourage you to check it out. If you like what you're hearing here on the Field and Garden podcast, we'd love it if you'd tell a friend about us and leave a review for us wherever you get your podcasts. So that's all for today. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jesse from the Gardener's Workshop, and I hope you have a great day. Mm-hmm.